I wanted to first give you a little bit of a background on this panel. Um, and, and first of all, uh, many thanks go to Wiley because they have uh, contributed both uh, information and uh, as well as some financial support for this filming of the panel. Um, when, uh, when we're academics, we do our research, we write our working papers, and we send them to the journals, and we hope that they get published in top journals. That's been my life for 40 years until, well, just a few years ago, I started working with the AFA, the American Finance Association, and I do the sort of business part of the Journal of Finance. And what I found out is that behind the scenes, there are many changes going on, some small, some quite large. And even though we are only interested in publishing in these top journals, there are changes that will have impact for, for people trying to, to publish in the future. So that's the motivation for this panel. And uh, I, my uh, jumbled ideas were I sent to Andrew Corelli, and he put it together in a really well-organized way. So I'm kind of the second string moderator here, and I'm passing the football to our first rate, first tier panelists. And, and, um, and, and you, you know them all quite well, but let me mention um, we have uh, Andrew Corelli on video. We have um, Philip Bond to my left, <laughs> representing the Journal of Finance. Uh, Stan Van Neumberg to my right, who's uh, representing the Review of Financial Studies. And Tony Whited on the uh, screen, who is representing the Journal of Financial Economics. So I'm really, really happy that uh, they're able to join us physically or by by Zoom conferencing. Um, okay, so what, uh, what Andrew was able to do with my jumbled ideas was to organize it into a topic we'll call open research. And within the category of open research, there are many different uh, issues such as uh, open data, open access, and open recognition and reward. So those will be kind of the topics that we'll concentrate on, at least at the beginning. So um, we'll, the, fir the first item, open research, uh, that is open data, will be the first one that we'd like to talk about. Um, there is, uh, of course, in the category of open data, there's both the data sharing and code sharing. And as you probably know, the Journal of Finance recently required that uh, anyone presenting um, their research would have to also publish their code. Now, the RFS, I believe, is starting that this year. And um, the question then is, what about the second part, the sharing of data. So I think the first question that we'll have for the panel to talk about is, what about publishing data? Um, what's, what's holding us back? And what's particular about finance that uh, has limited this, um, this step in this direction, where in other areas of, of science, this is a very um, standard practice. So um, I guess, uh, Stan, would you like to begin? <laughs> sure. Uh, for, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a great honor. It's also a great honor to serve all of you, uh, you know, as, as one of you at the, at the Review of Financial Studies. So um, one step we have taken at the RFS, as uh, you just mentioned, is to introduce a co-chairing policy. And we decided after some internal debate to just follow the model of the Journal of Finance because we thought uh, after review it actually made a lot of sense. 
Um, now, the way we think about this is science is a public good, and by making this code available, it's going to be uh, easier for people to replicate uh, what you have done, and then also to build on that more, more easily. Now, when it comes to data sharing, I think data sharing is potentially a much trickier issue, right? So many of us, I think, as finance is kind of, as the, fi as the financial uh, reality is, is one where we have fewer and fewer publicly listed firms, more and more private firms. A lot of the research is shifting towards private firms, and a lot of the data sources on these private firms tend to be private. Uh, many of us have spent a lot of time, effort, uh, grant money uh, trying to buy data, trying to cajole uh, data vendors into sharing data, uh, and have signed NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, with these, with these data vendors. And so I think under, these, under the terms of these NDAs, it's often very difficult uh, to share that data publicly. In fact, you probably would have never gotten the data if you, know, you had, would have had to promise uh, that you're going to make it publicly available on uh, you know, the website of the RFS or the, uh, or the JF or the GFE. Right? And so I think um, you know, in other instances, maybe the data is public, but uh, it requires there's physical limits on access to the data. Right? So for example, if you work with census data, you have to be on a census computer that's cut off from the internet. Uh, you have, it's a long application process to get there. Uh, some of my own work, I've used Swedish data. You have to be physically located in Sweden, or at least from a Swedish IP address to access the data. So there's a lot of physical barriers to, uh, to data sharing as well. So I think this is a very complex issue because of the nature of the data. I think it's going to become even more complex going forward. Uh, one idea I want to throw out there, and then I'll pass it on to, to the others. One idea I want to throw out there is that maybe there's something we could do collectively to make this uh, an easier problem. Uh, you know, one model could be like what the NBR has done for patent data, just kind of make this data available uh, in clean format uh, so that more research can be done along these lines. You know, another example of, of this is what uh, UNC, uh, the UNC Business School has done with the private equity data. They've built a consortium of uh, you know, five or six universities, each of which uh, has a representative, and then uh, you know they make available the Burgess private equity data uh, to any PhD student or any faculty member that applies. The application is vetted, and then the data is made available. So maybe collectively, this might be a model for us to to share data in the future. But I think there's lots of obstacles. I go. Philip, would you like to address that issue? Sure, thank you. Um, so again, thank you very much for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, I guess I should also preface this by saying these are my, I feel like a Fed employee. These are my own views and not, <laughs> not necessarily those of yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything, everything Stan said. Um, I do think that uh, despite the challenges of finding a way to share proprietary data, um, it's very important that we try to think creatively of how to do so. I think the I think we're all increasingly aware of the dangers of, of one form or another of sort of accidental specification bias in empirical research, and uh, we need to find some way to um, make some form of replication possible. And it is a and it's it is clearly a challenge. Um, one very speculative idea that I think uh, is worth considering, and this, this goes, by the way, a little bit along the lines of Stan was mentioning, maybe we could do something collectively, would be to encourage uh, like a relatively standard um, NDA contract that might stipulate that the data could be made available on, um, under very special circumstances to other researchers, right? For example, we could say that if other people want to look at the data, it could be available on an air, on an air gap computer. Um, this would not maybe quite be a binding rule. Journals would still be willing to publish stuff that didn't have such NDAs, but that statement would have to be disclosed and people could draw their, their own inferences. So that's one very speculative idea. Clearly there are various um, sort of avenues one can think of for addressing this problem, but I do think it's something we need to sort of try to get out uh, ahead of. The other thing I should, I should mention here, because it's, it's related, although, although slightly differently, is there, are, you know, I start to hear too many anecdotes where data providers um, are very selective in the projects they get the data for. Um, so many of these are sort of, I guess, uh, are anecdotes that I wouldn't particularly want to share, but um, 
One good one is actually one that Luigi Zingales has posted uh, on, the, on the Stigler Center website, um, which is which hence is easy to share. Um, so he points out that Uber have been very forthcoming about about making their data available to researchers in some domains. For example, people have been writing papers on the potential welfare gains that Uber delivers to um, to drivers by giving them flexible schedules. But there are other projects for which Uber have been extremely uh, hesitant to give the data out. So a big one has been safety. So when it came to safety data, Uber brought in their own set of consultants who did a sort of a very directed study under, under Uber's remit. And we really have, you know, we don't have a good sense of what biases that did or didn't introduce. Um, so that's a slightly different problem to sort of replication within, within academics, but I think it's also an important problem for us to, to bear in mind. And um, let me ask Tony to comment also on data and replication issues. So I am going to also extend a lot of thanks for inviting me, and I'm also going to give the Fed um, um, this, these are my opinions and may not be shared by others. I was at a very interesting meeting at the AFAs about, that was um, organized by the AEA about how to make data, how to uh, make everything more reproducible in an era where data is private. And Hal Varian, who I think is working for Google now, came up with an interesting idea. He said, these, we are not, um, using the technology available to make fake data that gives identical results. And he was giving forth ideas about putting a, a small segment of real data available and then showing that the fake data gave the same result and then giving the fake, the entire fake data. And he said that the computer scientists are good enough that they can make fake data that gives identical results to real data. And I thought that was an interesting way to get around this problem of private data. Um, and then the joy of going third is that Phil and Stein already said a lot of what I wanted to say. So I'm done. <laughs> the, um, I was going to mention that uh, we have a few questions for the panel to go through and then we'll open it up to the audience and so if you, if you have questions that come to mind, um, you know, please, please uh, keep that thought and we'll have microphones uh, because again, we're recording this and so we'll need to, um, to hear your question on, on the microphone. So um, the second item in the open research um, area that, uh, that we wanted to talk about is open access. And um, clearly, open access is something that, whether we like it or not, is going to be pretty much a requirement in the future, in my opinion. Um, the, um, right now, so open access means that uh, your paper, your article is free, is not behind any paywall. Right now, our three journals basically allow people to uh, opt into open access by paying uh, approximately three thousand five hundred to uh, to have that that uh, available with your particular paper. That's what's called the hybrid model uh, in open access, meaning that such journals as the Journal of Finance or the RFS or JFE um, have both um, subscription based articles as well as open access when the author so requests. But in the future, it's quite likely that journals will be completely open access and this will completely change the revenue models, particularly for association related journals like the uh, JF. So um, the, um, the questions comes up then, uh, what, what's good, oh, and, and let me mention that in, in certain um, countries, in Europe, for example, Germany requires that any uh, government-supported research has to be published in open access. Uh, California is moving in that direction, and others 
So, like I said, this is, in my opinion, going to be a requirement in the future. And so the question is, what, what, is, what is this going to do um, to, um, to authors and to, and to journals? So I guess the uh, one question here is um, what, um, um, you know, what, what impact is open access going to have on, you know, the journals? Are we going to be publishing fewer papers or more papers? Um, and who's going to pay for this? Uh, so uh, I'll go to Tony first, who, uh, since you have, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. you, you didn't get a chance to uh, share all your ideas last time. So open access is coming, and open access has different flavors in different countries. So there's something called Plan S. And Plan S is something that a, a variety of European countries have bought into. And it's a little bit more stringent than open access. It says that if you your um, research is sponsored by the government, it has to be published in a journal that is 100% open access. And that's very different. So that means that if you are doing this grant-based research, a journal like the JFERFS, JF would be off limits for you because it's a hybrid journal. That's something, that's an interesting political statement that is designed to nail the publishers because they think that the publishers are make too many profits, which we have different opinions on, but that I think that is the political um, motivation for that. So. My thought on open access is that it's a tax on research that is not sponsored by grants, which is a, a lot of economics, finance research, and all a lot of research in humanities and the other social sciences. The open access model, it came into being from the idea that the grant providers would chip in the open access fee, but I don't, I've never had a grant, so I, this would come out of my research account or my own pocket or the university would find some place to pay to some way to pay and so in that sense it's a tax on the types of research that are not um, sponsored by grants and so that, i think that's something that the policymakers, especially in europe and in california really hadn't thought through all the way that it's going to be something of a burden on those of us who don't get grants that are worth a couple million dollars every year. There we go. There's my opinion. Philip? I mean, I guess on this most recent point, I, I mean, trying to, trying to think through this without success. There's some sort of coast theorem here, I think, where the, the amount of, <laughs> in, the, in the end, there's a block of money that's currently going from universities to publishers. And there's obviously scope to both reduce that block of money and maybe to have it take slightly different forms, that some of which might even be socially beneficial. And in principle, the university could move the money around. It could take, and this is going to, I think, what, what Tony was hinting at, it could go from the university spending the money on subscriptions to the university spending the money to make direct payments to, to publishers. Um, now, we might fear, and I think this is now exactly what, what Tony was getting at, that somehow that transfer would never take place and the university would just cut the, cut the library budget without sort of putting it into our research accounts um, in compensation. Um, but that is, um, I guess that, but, I, I feel, but trying to think through this, I feel both puts into perspective the, the, the danger, I guess I'm less negative than Tony about this thought, because in the end there is scope to move the money around. Um, but it also makes me less optimistic about the, the upside because in the end, to the extent to which we think the publisher is doing anything useful, and maybe we can come back to that shortly, um, but to the extent to which we think the publisher is doing something useful and, and we need to compensate them for their, for their time, again, it just feels like shifting money around in a way where it's not, it's not quite clear what's gained either. To stand. Thank you. And to, to elaborate just a little bit further on this redistribution point, so I think there is indeed like uh, within a university redistribution from the library, library budget to the researcher's budget, but then there's also kind of an across university redistribution where 
you know, I think a lot of the places where a lot of the research is being produced, uh, that's where a lot of the open access fees will be paid. And other universities where maybe there's kind of slightly more consumption of research than production of research, uh, they will actually have to pay fewer open access fees, right? And so there'll be like a redistribution, if you like, from the uh, uh, research producers, let's call them the top universities, to the maybe the second tier universities, and that might be the right way around redistribution, if, if you like. So I, I see that potentially as a positive. Um, uh, the other thing is that, I mean, I think we can make the business model for our journals work with open access fees in the realm of what you were mentioning, something like $3,500. Um, you know, they could probably be lower, but then we would have to keep the submission fees. So, uh, you know, at the RFS, we've done the calculation that, you know, for every uh, 13 submission fees, we publish one paper, right? Um, and so there's kind of a certain cutoff submission fee that would allow us to essentially have a zero access fee, or there could be uh, just an open access fee and no submission fee, or some sort of two-part tariff where there's a combination of, you know, let's call it a $300 submission fee and a $2,500 um, open access fee that would make our business model essentially work the way it does today. So I don't see it as necessarily a, you know, a problem. I think this redistribution is potentially an advantage. And then I think the biggest picture advantage from open access is that you know, our, our research will be available to nonprofits, to uh, universities all over the world who today sometimes are just stuck behind that paywall, to companies. Uh, so, you know, what a concept. Our research might actually have more real-world relevance, and some of our ideas might get implemented in practice. So I think that is like an enormous advantage that we should not lose sight of. In, um, in some of the thoughts that Andrew put down, uh, he mentioned that um, when we talk about subsidies, the, the, um, the point he was making is that uh, should NBA tuition be paying for open access charges, and maybe, Andrew, you could make a couple of comments about that. Well, I, I think a lot about, I think, uh, thanks, thanks, Jim, and thanks for involving me, and thank you for stepping up uh, in my place to, uh, to moderate this panel. I've, I've enjoyed it so far. Uh, I, I guess part of me asks uh, about sourcing of the funds, uh, and I almost am taking kind of a university perspective here on uh, this, this distribution, this new distribution model that Stein is, uh, is describing. And, and I think about, uh, from a transparency standpoint, how the sourcing of these, these potential fees and how, how they, would, they would come to play. I also have in the back of my mind here, and I don't know if you were gonna get to that, Jim, but uh, the fact that, you know, Part of, the, part of what's happening here is the open access movement is trying to grab back some of the rents that the large publishing houses have secured. Some of the, some of the large publishing, publishing houses are, are well, well, uh, well funded themselves. Others are much smaller. And there could be that part of, part of what happens here is that we see an even further consolidation in the business. But even if you just think about the compression in terms of the margins for some of these publishing houses themselves, um, you can um, almost imagine that that is going to be, um, they're not going to stand still. That is going to turn around and imply that uh, perhaps uh, when it comes time for renegotiations with the associations like the Society for Financial Studies or the American Finance Association, that that inframarginal contract negotiation that will take place is going to be a lot less generous uh, than it once was as they try to recover uh, some of their lost margins that translate into all of this thing. Now, none of this will happen in sort of a shock event. It's going to be a slow, steady uh, shift uh, if this open access movement takes hold. Um, and I guess the one thing I would ask from, the, from our, our editors on the panel here is, is how they would think about uh, um, prospectively uh, with the potential pressures from publishers, um, the, the conflicts of interest that arise from differentiating perhaps submissions that are submitted, knowing that they're going to be published in the hybrid model as a full open access versus ones that would go under the normal subscription-based model and how they think about their decision. Could you imagine an editor having to think differently about two different submissions coming to them um, in these two different approaches. 
Listen. Okay. So I guess I'll go first. Um, so I, f I feel this is going to sound worse than I intended to. So um, I just I just feel in terms of conflicts of interest that any editor faces so many conflicts of interest on a daily basis anyway, um, which I I try extremely hard to. Uh, ignore, as I'm sure uh, almost all editors do, that the idea that, the, that this particular conflict of interest where I would view differentially um, articles submitted that we're going to pay an open access fee to those which aren't, this seems so far down the list of potential conflicts of interest that I'm, I'm sort of willing to round it to, to zero and not worry about it. So, um, but again, don't, I, you know, like I say, don't, don't get me wrong that this is, you know, all of us are trying extremely hard to uh, to rise above conflicts of interest whenever they arise. So. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you know the one thing we have as a journal is a reputation, and you know that's what we're trying to maximize. So I cannot imagine that we would, on the margin, pick a paper for the three thousand five hundred dollar <laughs> open access fee. It just doesn't strike me as a as a as, as a realistic concern. Tony, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? I, I I agree. I think. There are so many other issues with conflict of interest that are so much more important. I, I agree that this is largely rounding error. Um, one, one more question in the open access uh, category. Do, do you think that open access, uh, if journals become entirely open access, Will this have any uh, overlap in the other um, category of like open data? Tony, do, Tony, do you have any? Oh, I'll start. I, I think of these things as very separate issues. I don't see how, because the open access is about the publishers, the way that, uh, research is distributed, and it's about the way that the publishers make money. The sharing of data is something that's more about the intellectual community. And so I think that those are there are two issues that come up in very different contexts. And so I think they're separate. I, agree. Yeah. I, think, I mean, there is a link one can imagine drawing, which is if we, if we really were to be fully open access, so that a journal article would look largely like many other things one could find on the web. Um, so the two items would look much more comparable. I think there would potentially be pressure on journals to increase the value they're adding in the system. And one of those could potentially be precisely in validating data and empirical work. So it is, so it is possible, this is not definitely not a strong prediction, but it's definitely possible that a move towards full open access would um, would push journals to do better in a number of dimensions, possibly including delivering better on, on the validation of empirical work. And the, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the governments are pushing towards open access, and they may very well be pushing towards open data uh, as a second step. So the, um, you know, there, there is, Clearly, I think overlap in terms of regulation. Do you do you see any other uh, possible implications from from government trying to um, push journals and societies in in, uh, in particular directions of open research, open data, data, open access? I mean, like I said earlier, I think this is by and large a, a healthy movement to the extent that it forces us to be more outward facing as a, as a profession. I mean, I think we have kind of, you know, I, I guess economists in general in society are under threat, right? I mean, we're like in the bottom of the reputation list among, among all professions. So I think it's incumbent upon us and maybe the journals in particular to, to kind of be outward facing. And I think some journals, I mean, I'm thinking of the AER, for example, you know, they've hired a professional journalist to, you know, summarize some of the most policy relevant articles, make it accessible to a broader audience. Uh, you know, some of the journal editors are tweeting about, about the forthcoming paper. So I think, you know, that kind of outward, more, you know, this, this kind of 
duty to, uh, to, to serve society kind of more broadly is potentially, is potentially an important mission for, for our journals to think about kind of above and beyond kind of the certification of the quality of the papers that we publish. And so I see this kind of you know, as, a, as a healthy movement that we are forced to think along those lines. Um, so yeah. I mean, there are always a million things to worry about, and, <laughs> and I, I find it very easy to worry about many things. But um, uh, but no, I have you know I, I don't see any particular particular threat with this. Tony, do you have anything to add to? No, nothing more to add on that one. <laughs> So the, um, the third category of open research, um, we wanted to talk about open recognition and reward. And what we mean, um, kind of a broad interpretation of this category would be uh, the important role of top journals in, 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 the, in the role of certification of, of high quality research. And um, the, uh, so currently, as you well know, we, we, we don't just count citations anymore. We, um, you know, we can look at downloads. Um, we can look at, uh, um, you know, other social, uh, sorry, other, other um, metrics that, you know, may be related to social media, blogs, podcasts, uh, and so forth. So. Um, the, um, um, the, the question is, is are, the, are journals going to be preeminent in, uh, in certification, which of course is their, um, their, main, um, their main purpose? I think so. I think our job is to basically you know, receive 1,300 manuscripts a year and select 130 best ones, right? So I think that's, that's kind of, and we do this, by the way, with a lot of the help of, of high quality referees like, like all of you, uh, associate editors uh, and editors, right? So we are all working towards this goal together. Um, I think that job is kind of very different from the job that, uh, you know, uh, the NBR reporter or Vox EU blogs or uh, Arvid Gupta's tweets. Uh, I know many of you have, are receiving them, right? So there, we are living in this world already where, you know, there's all these other channels of, of, of communication, of research. You know, we get the weekly emails from the CEPR or the MBR. So there's a lot of ways of getting visibility for research besides the journals. You know, our process is, is, is I think, to some extent, orthogonal to that. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't communicate about the, about the papers that we are publishing. I think, the, you know, the journals have been doing a better job uh, along those lines but I see these as, as different, and, and I think our certification job is not really in jeopardy. I think it's Tony's Tony's yeah, Tony, do you, would you like to comment on? So, a little bit. So I think that the, the job of certification will never go away. I do wonder if, and this is very speculative, if the, the fact that, that things, when things become more open, when there's open access, if some very smart person will come up with a new model of certification that the community at large finds viable and that they believe in. So I think that that's something that could conceivably happen. If when you change the way that information is disseminated, you change the playing field and something might sprout up. So if, Immediately, I don't imagine what that would be, but I think that the basic role that we all play, that we find referees, we read referee reports, all of you write good referee reports, I don't think that that whole process is going to change in any way. It might be organized differently, but the certification will stay. Um, I mean, I guess the one thing I would add to this, so, so, like, so like, like Tony, I think, um, Certification, it's, it's hard to imagine a world without some form of certification, exactly as Tony said. It's, as the world changes, certification could take um, another form, right? I mean, one, we could have like the Robert, you know, Robert Parker, the famous wine critic. We could have the Robert Par Parker of uh, finance research, I guess. Um, one thing I would say, though, here is that, um, you know, there's a perception that academic journals can be very clubby. I worry a lot that other forms of certification 
would be far, far worse in that dimension. And we would actually look back at this uh, relatively democratic age where we submitted to, to journals as opposed to um, a more concentrated world, which I fear would be much clubbier. If I can add one more thing maybe to that, which is that you know, I think the finance journal, so one, one problem, one threat could be if we had an incredibly slow turnaround time, right? But I think the finance journals actually do a very good job compared to, let's say, the economics, the top economics journals in that respect. So I think that's buying us, I think, a lot of credibility as well, that we can provide high quality turnaround time, uh, high quality feedback in, in a reasonable turnaround time. And, and this is this is one of my questions, um, which is, um, you know, we we've been now I, I think generally accepted the idea that there are top three journals in finance, and when I started um, many many years ago, for example, the RFS didn't exist. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, are top th are just three journals? Uh, being top journals in finance, is that enough? Um, you know, what are the chances of another journal coming up? And then as our profession gets larger, maybe not so much in North America, but when you add Europe and Asia to the mix, um, that's a lot of researchers now competing for very limited space in our top three journals. Yeah, so I'm so sorry, I didn't admit, you don't have to go first, but... <laughs> You're looking at me. So. Yeah, I'm looking at you. <laughs> so just to put some numbers uh, to what, what Jim just said. So um, in the last 25 years, I'm just going to look up some numbers here. The number of paper submissions to the top three finance journals has gone from 1,300 to 4,700. So it's essentially, the profession has essentially tripled in terms of volume uh, of submissions because of the globalization. Um, you know, maybe also because um, maybe to a lesser extent there's more authors on a paper than there used to be. The number of papers published in these same three journals has essentially doubled over that same period. So the number of submissions tripled, the number of publications doubled. So the top three finance journals collectively have not kept up with the, si with the growth and the size of the profession. Now, just looking at the RFS uh, in particular, so you know, the numbers are roughly similar. So we've had about, this is just in the last 10 years, our submissions have gone up from 768 to 1325. So that's basically a 5.6% growth rate every year in the last 10 years. That's a 73% growth rate. Our, uh, our publications have gone up 63%. So I think the RFS has actually done a better job, if I may say that, than uh, our two peer journals <laughs> in growing with the size of the profession. And um, we have made collectively at the RFS as the editorial team, uh, a, a strong stance, a strong statement that we want to grow with the size of the profession. And so we have in fact expanded our number of articles from 90 a year to about 130 a year over the last, uh, let's call it 10 years. And we think this is a good thing and we plan to continue to do this because it is our belief that we can better serve you, uh, the profession, uh, as the profession grows, you know, by expanding, uh, you know, on the margin and without having to sacrifice quality um, the number of publications. And the, the fact that we can do this without sacrificing quality is, is, is kind of proven by our impact factor, which has actually risen quite substantially in the last several years from uh, 3.1 in 2014 to 4.3 in 2017 to 5.0 in 2018, for the first time surpassing the JFE. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess I'm not, I'm not sure that we should expect the number of published papers to grow in line with the profession. That doesn't sound like something that would come out of many natural models we would, we would write down. Um, but, I, but, 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 go, go, but going, to, the, to, going to, to Jim's question, I guess, I guess my own view is I'm, I'm less concerned about the number and perhaps more about the homogeneity that um, stands comments notwithstanding. I feel that to, you know, we're all trying to occupy more or less the same sort of space uh, in, 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 on the hoteling line in journal space. Um, and there does seem scope for more differentiation. So just an example, I think the, the, a, the, um, the AEA Insights uh, Journal, which has only recently been published, seems like an interesting uh, model to track the development of. Because I think, you know, I think more than increased number, we could perhaps do with more, uh, with more heterogeneity of style in the profession. Tony, would you like to 
address the issue. See everything you tell me. <laughs> Having once tried to start a journal, I was one of the people who started finance research letters. It's one thing that I observed is that they have to start, a, the finance research letters is not a high impact factor journal, but I observed in this process that if to start a new journal, it has to start at the top because the only direction is down. For, for a new journal. Later, it, there can be fluctuations. And so I think that for, if the number of journals is going to expand, it needs a few ex extremely high energy young people to go and get it. And so to the extent that we serendipitously have a group of people that are willing to do something like that, we'll see more journals. And to the extent that that serendipitously does not happen, maybe not. I think um, we have time um, now to, um, to take questions from the audience. And uh, Abner and Ginny have volunteered to pass around a microphone, so. Um, So if, if you raise your hand, we will uh, pass a microphone to you. Uh, does this work? Yeah. Um, have you given thought to listing <coughs> authors in their order of contribution? Um, I've given minimal thought to it. So again, so again, there has been a suggestion that author num that author names are always entered into a random number generator um, and they come out in random order and that when this order has been adopted a little symbol goes uh, goes next to it it's like an R in a circle um, which I think is an interesting idea I think uh, I think again the AER has played with this idea I think there has not been that much adoption yet if I understand right um, but that's um, I think it's an interesting idea worth watching. I agree with that, especially since my last name starts with a V. <laughs> <laughs> so I also like the idea of the randomization of authors' names. The idea of um, a primary author comes largely from the lab sciences, where the person who funds the research is the last author. The person who actually bothers to write the paper is the first author. And anybody who makes a small piece of equipment is another author. And so I think that given that our um, model of producing research is so different, the idea of a, of a prime author usually doesn't make sense. And so I very much like the idea of the random order, especially since I'm W. <laughs> It seems to me that journals serve three purposes, one of which have changed dramatically and is affecting the discussion today. One is the certification, which we've talked about. The other is the editorial service and advice they provide to authors. And the third is distribution, which has supported the whole infrastructure of the journal system paying of editors, paying of referees, along with submission fees and so forth. And what's really changed is distributions become free, which has kind of knocked out the publishers as being very relevant. The thing that's curious about the whole discussion here is why we're still talking about journals as being monopolies, so we have to have copyrights and we have to compete with each other. We could still, you know, there are lots of businesses that, for example, support themselves giving things away for free, you know, Gmail, for example, and you know, universities and researchers just haven't become clever enough about doing this. We don't need certification necessarily from one journal or monopoly. You could get certification if you're willing to pay the submission fee from multiple journals. I mean, it costs nothing to publish anything. And you could pay for the editorial service that the journal provides. And I just wonder if we're not thinking enough out of the box on how journals ought to operate given these three economic functions that they serve and the fact that we could, in fact, support things financially the way private businesses often do. 
I mean, I think our business model in some sense is already doing this this unbundling in the sense that the submission fees largely pay for the refereeing and the editorial services, right? Because you're right, I think the editor, the actual printing, the, the you know, the Oxford University presses of this world, they're offering minimal services at this point. I mean, basically copy editing and then putting the thing on a website. We could probably purchase these services somewhere else much more cheaply, uh, right? And so I think that's true. I think that business model is being disrupted, but I think the certificate that doesn't take away that the certification part costs money too. That's what the, you know, that's what the submission fees pay for. Why do we need one journal, one publication? You can have three journal, three top journals certifying the paper if you want. Well, now you get a lot of duplication of effort. I think, right? So, I mean, I think we already have a lot of duplication of effort in our profession, right? Any paper gets discussed multiple times. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people are looking over a paper carefully, but before it actually ever gets published. You know, I think there's a reasonable question to ask, you know, why don't we have like a top conference like this one and we publish all the papers in, in, a, in a conference volume and that becomes, you know, a very prestigious publication. Yeah. I mean, one issue with what you said, Mark, is that, I mean, you, you, you pointed out that part of the service of the profession is the editorial service, which I'm obviously very sympathetic towards that view. Um, but it's, that's hard to see how that would be duplicated across multiple journals. We can't, we all, arguably already have too many people involved in this, in this process without having multiple different journals all having their input all at once. Tony, do you have? I have not been able to hear a lot of the discussion, and so I could say something completely random that was not relevant. <laughs> All right, so, so I'll ask the, the mean question. Uh, if you were a social planner, and you wanted to, you thought it was valuable to create and distribute knowledge. Would you design the system we have now? I mean, again, I, I feel there's some sort of coast theorem here, where the, yeah. you know, at least, at, at least, at least for the for, for the JF and the RFS, these are the contracts with the publishers are negotiated relatively frequently. Um, so it's hard to see why either, in this case, Wiley or the OUP should be making vast rents out of either the JF or the RFS, so because the, the contract is, is negotiated it's often with, with meaningful changes. So right now, for example, um, and this has sort of come up in the background, the AFA is deriving some income from um, subscriptions to the AFA, to, to, to the JF, and then it disperses that, you know, the office, as I'm sure Jim will uh, second this, the offices of the AFA, as far as I know, uh, are, not, are not getting rich off this. So this, this money is being used for what I think are broadly socially valuable purposes. And we could shift things around, so we could get rid of the subscription fee along the lines that Mark is saying. Um, and in return, we would have to have higher submission fees and maybe even pay to publish fees or some form there would be some payment somewhere else, and maybe the AFA would do a little bit less and would have higher um, attendance fees for the meetings. And this feels a lot like just shuffling dollars around from one pocket to another with perhaps some distributional consequences, but probably not huge distributional consequences, and without hugely obvious incentive effects. So I, you know, this probably isn't the system we would, we would design right now, but I'm not sure how big the welfare cost is relative to, to what we might design. Yeah. I mean, I would say like, you know, I think it's healthy to have multiple outlets, uh, you know, for the authors because, you know, there's a lot of randomness in the process. So it's good to have, you know, a range of outlets to submit your work to. Um, I think there's a lot of duplication of effort. I think the social planner probably would, uh, you know, want to have fewer than like 15 referee reports plus discussions per paper, right? So I think, but I think that's kind of the cost for of, of having these multiple outlets it's healthy i think to have some competition between journals as well right so i think it's this type of competition that has let the rfs for example to you know make take some risks with some new innovation uh, the register proposals we did for the fintech and for the climate finance for example and and i think that's a you know that's clearly a benefit 
of having this uh, multiple journal uh, system. Tony, um, were you able to? Well, what I, so I, the one, one of the things that I heard from a previous questioner was that publishing is free and it's not free. It's just become much lower cost. So in this, um, in this environment where we don't have to print out anything or mail things out or use paper, I think that we probably, I don't know if we would organize things into three groups. Maybe we would, I don't know if three is the optimal number, but I suspect that given that costs have come way down, we might um, organize this very differently. So I think the, the three comes from the fact that we used to have, there were used to be large fixed costs of having a journal. And so having, having an entity that's large enough to make that worth it, it was something that happened. And I don't think that would happen now. And perhaps we will evolve toward that. I don't know. I have one question. Um, if you can think about an alternative world where we are forced to have open access, no referring, can you think about certification in this alternative world and how it is relative to the lengthy referring process that we have now? What would happen? I think it's like a Yelp for good and bad. Something like that. <laughs> <I won't. laughs> so the journal in the physical sciences that comes close to what you've just described, and, and it's arguable whether it's a successful model, is uh, PLOS One. And uh, it essentially has a very light edit editing. Uh, it is uh, popular, large numbers of submissions. It has approximately a 50% acceptance rate. It commissions maybe one or two referees in this light editorial uh, effort. Uh, that is displayed using technology in uh, it's there's no physical physical journal in any way whatsoever it's all posted and then there is a um, curation of comments that follows thereafter so this is a, a journal with an alternative model that is fully leveraging technology um, and uh, and has obviously a very different certification process built in I don't know if the social planner would have built one of those. I, th I think Stan uh, mentioned uh, about the refereeing process. It can can you comment a little bit more about you know is our is our refereeing process um, well I won't really use the word optimal but is is are there ways to improve it that. Uh, that you uh, have seen or, or, um, or what experiences have you gathered from, from, from that refereeing process? I mean, maybe one, uh, one thing, so sometimes people ask, you know, what's a good way for, uh, in particular, young referees who are starting out in the profession to kind of get some feedback on their work? Right, and so you know, I think a lot of us often share our decision letter and the other referee reports with the uh, with with the referees uh, as well as with the authors, and I think that's kind of a a good mechanism for uh, for learning potentially. Uh, I think overall, my experience has been that you know the overall quality of the referee reports is in general very good, and again, I thank you for for all your efforts. Uh, at the RFS, I don't know, I think this might be true in other journals, we score our referees. So all of you have a whole, and we keep track of your entire history. <laughs> so we, and we have fixed effects. We estimate fixed effects for your uh, referee scores. And so we know, you know, we know, um, you know, who our best referees are. So ideas that, and, and again, this is my personal opinion, you know, you could imagine a system, and you know, we have not, done, not gone there, but you could imagine a system where uh, you get matched with, uh, with the same, if you're an A referee, you get matched with an A, uh, if, you're an a uh, if you're an A referee and you submit a paper as an author, you get an A referee. If you're a B referee and you, you're gonna draw from the B referee pool, um, you know, along the same lines, you could imagine, uh, we keep track of, of turnaround times as well, you could imagine that you'll, you'll be held to your own 
uh, you know, average turnaround time. And you, even if the referee reports come back before, the system will submit the paper back to you exactly uh, at your average referee time. Um, so I think there's a lot of mechanisms we could come up with that would, uh, you know, create better incentives. But overall, my impression is the system works really, really well in finance. I mean, certainly one thing I would say is that, you know, the, I think there's a claim out there that referee reports have a low correlation between them. This has not been my experience at all, that uh, even, even in cases where people issue different summary judgments, frequently when I read the reports, they have very highly correlated comments. So I think, I think this idea that opinions are random and uncorrelated, um, at, least, at least on the set of papers that I have handled, which by now is quite large, um, is, 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 is not at all the case. Um, since Stan sort of obliquely uh, sort of mentioned advice, the one, the one thing I always say in these things is um, when you like a paper and you actually recommend acceptance or revision, say why. Like it's, it's much, it happens much more frequently than you would think that someone says, uh, I like this paper, I recommend uh, a revision, and then goes immediately to all the things they don't like about it. And it's um, very puzzling as, uh, as an editor to then understand why they are recommending a revision. No. Tony. So I also think that the refereeing process is not terribly broken. And my observation is that many authors think that they get stupid referees and I, my observation is that that opinion, and yet I think the referee reports are so careful that I am so happy that people are putting so much effort into these reports. I think it's miscommunication, and people miscommunicate when they get all their emotions get involved. And so I think that this perception of random opinions and poor quality of referees comes from the fact that it's hard for not very naturally, me too, everybody to think about, to communicate their ideas and to talk to each other in a way that they actually understand. And it's, I think that the system's mostly not broken. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Um, <laughs> Um, Andrew, anything else? Uh, any final thoughts? No, I've, my final thoughts, Jim, are uh, that I love listening. Uh, you know, I spent seven years in this business. Uh, I've been away from it for a year, um, sort of. And you, you uh, seem and surprisingly I, sad about that, Andrew. <laughs> was it not me? No, no. I, I was commenting that you seem you seem not as happy as you might be about. <laughs> about no, being no. I was going to I was going to commend you, Philip, uh, Stein, and Tony. Uh, it just gives me uh, great confidence for um, for all of us in this business that we have such thoughtful people in leadership roles uh, guiding us um, to be able to think about some of the big issues that are not just immediate, like today and tomorrow, but you know, five years and 10 years down the line with this, this big open research movement that is, that is, uh, that is happening. I, I'm, I'm grateful to the three of you for your service. And I, I'm pretty sure everybody in that room thinks the same way as I do. So that's my final thought. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. And, and thank you, Tony, Philip, and, and Stan. Um, and uh, anyway, let's give them a good round of applause.